Um, this morning we have a special treat for you, and uh, a couple months ago we advertised one of our very own, Libby Green. Uh, God put on her heart a passion to go to Liberia and to be a part of a, well, this is a little bit different than a short-term missions trip. It wasn't actually so short. She was working with the Welches there. Libby is back, praise the Lord. Great job. Let's give it up for Libby. She's going to come up and give a testimony for us. I'll get you some lights, too. Well, that video only shows like this much of my trip, the tiniest bit. And so there's so much that I can share. There's so many things that I could tell you about how the Lord really worked in my heart and in my life. Um, but I'll just tell you a little bit. Um, so as you can see in the video, for most of the time, I was with kids at a school. Um, I really was there. My goal wasn't to have a specific purpose there or a specific mission, but the Lord, I feel him calling me to be a missionary in the mission field. So really what I did was I lived in their lives for a month, and it was not easy. I saw everything of what it's like, the hardship um, just living in a new culture, um, it's just so, so different. It's, it's very, very difficult. Um, but the Lord really, really spoke to me and worked in my heart and just kind of has shown me that this is, this is what he wants me to do. Um, and it can be a little scary and look a little unknown, so it's hard. But this trip really, really touched my heart. Um, and while I was there, I was like, Lord... I don't, I'm here, and I was like, oh, great, they speak English. They don't speak English very well. It's Liberian English, so for the first, like, week and a half, I was like, okay, Lord, like, I thought it would be a little easier, kind of adjusting, but it's not. But praise the Lord, he helped me to learn how to speak to, like, them and understand them, and so that helped. But um, really going in a whole new culture is, is, is a lot. But one of the things that the Lord placed on my heart was just, like, Libby, just love. That's why you're here to love because it's hard to see a culture where if those kids don't go to school, they don't know what love is because the missionaries there are the only people who love them. And so you go to a place like that and you try to teach them about Jesus loves you so much and you have hope and you're so loved and you're precious and they don't understand what that means. They'll never know unless people go and they show them. That's just the way it is. So while I was there, I was really just loving on all those kids and just showing them what that looked like. And I felt like they worked in my heart and God worked in my heart much more than I had an impact there. But yet the people were so, so loving and so thankful that I was there and so kind. I had one of the young men, he was in one of the pictures in the beginning, the day before I left, he went into town, and he spent all day in town, which you have to pay money to travel, and these people, they don't have money. They don't have anything. They don't have a lot of anything, and he came back, and he's like, I want to take you to the airport. I want to travel with you guys because I want to say goodbye to my little sister, and he's 26, and he was sitting down, and he was just talking to me, and he was really pouring into me. He was one of the pastors there, and he was just so loving and so kind, and he pulls out things that he bought for me. He bought me a dress. He bought me shoes. He bought me jewelry, and I looked at him, and I was crying because, you know, he doesn't have money half of the time to feed himself or his family, and so when you go, I was just really touched by the Lord there, and there's so much so much more I could say, but one of the other things that the Lord really showed me was we're so blessed. I'm coming back here, and I'm so humbled, so humbled beyond belief. If I could have been a little girl born in Liberia. I could have grown up like that. I could have had nothing. Most of them, they don't have any hope. They don't have any future. They, again, they don't know what love is until they're shown the love of Jesus. And so we're just so blessed. We've been given so much. And the Bible says when you're given much, you're asked more. You're asked to give more. So I've been given so much, and I didn't do anything to deserve it. I was just born here. But yet now I'm called to give. 
And so that's just a word for you is we're so blessed beyond what we know. So just don't be afraid to give and help. And I'm not saying you need to go to Africa and be a missionary. That's, that's not it. That's not everyone's calling. But I do feel like this trip really solidified the Lord calling me to go and to serve. And I don't really know what that looks like yet. But this trip really, really impacted my heart and really God has really spoke through me. And so this probably won't be the last time that I might be up here sharing about a trip or a ministry. So I just want to thank you all for your prayers and your support and your love because it's not very safe there a lot of the times. And there's a lot of disease and things. I had malaria when I was there and praise the Lord. It wasn't bad. Um, but your prayers and your prayers of protection and everything, they really, really help and they mean a lot. Talking to the missionaries there, they don't take lightly the support that they get. They really appreciate it and they really need it. So you guys are a big part in ministry and in missions when you support as well. So just thank you for your support and love to me. Thank you, thank you. Uh, that's awesome. So I just appreciate you following the leading of the Lord, and it wasn't easy, but it's, it's an example for us, as you said, to step out of our comfort zone, right, to realize how blessed we are, and for God to use us in whatever mission field he's put us in, because your neighborhood is a mission field. Your workplace is a mission field. Your school is a mission field. Amen. And uh, sometimes we don't realize that, but God wants to move us out of our comfort zone so that he can use us. And it's really amazing, and we're going to talk about it today, that how when God uses us, we think that we might be spent when God uses us, but how God invests back in us when we're open to doing that. So let's give Libby another round of applause. Thank you so much for sharing. And I see that you taught those kids my dance moves, so it's cool to know that those have gone around the world. I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey, today we're going to be taking a look at Matthew chapter 5. And so if you have your Bible, you can get that ready to go there. Of course, we'll have the words up here on the screen for you. Um, but in Matthew chapter 5, and we won't look at all of verses 1 through 12, but there we see a part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount that is known as the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes detail what our attitudes should look like as Christians. The formation of these attitudes are not merely mindsets. Okay? This isn't just something God wants me to know. Yes, he wants us to know what his word says, but he wants us to become what his word says. He wants the qualities of Christ's character to be revealed and developed in our hearts. A couple weeks ago, we looked at Proverbs chapter 4.23. Before I get any further, I want to thank Pastor B for doing a great job last week. Give it up for Pastor B. Great job. Woo! We looked at Proverbs 4.23, and it says this, Above all else, guard your heart, because everything you do flows from it. When God looks at who you are, your identity in him, he's looking at your heart, and the word says that everything you're going to do, what you say, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? How you're going to live your life, these are the things that flow out of our hearts. I think Matthew chapter 5 is so cool because here Jesus shares the Beatitudes in the form of promises that are accompanied by blessings. How many of you want to be blessed? I want to be blessed. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be blessed. Do you know that God wants to bless you? As your pastor, I want you to be blessed, right? In order for us to do that, though, we're going to have to focus on the blessings and the attitudes of God that bring about those promises and the fulfillment of them. So today we're going to look at one particular blessing that comes from Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. You've heard it before. Holy Spirit, let it sink into our hearts Today, let your word change us in the mighty name of Jesus, Matthew 5, 6. It says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Here's the promise. For they will be filled in Jesus' name. 
Amen. That word filled in the Greek is hartazo. I'm not Greek, so I probably didn't say it right, but I said the best I could, right? And it, it carries with it this sense of being full or satisfied. When you think about being hungry, and maybe not just hungry, but hangry, and you finally get something good to eat, and you eat to the point of where you're satisfied, that's what this verse is trying to convey. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled to the full to satisfaction. Let's begin by talking about righteousness. Righteousness, according to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, is defined as acting in accord with divine or moral law, being free from guilt or sin. Okay? Now, we have no ability on our own to achieve this because the Bible says all of us sin. All of us violate God's righteousness. We fall short of his glory. Righteousness is an attribute that belongs to God alone. Amen? It's his. Now, the cool thing about righteousness, this, this, this purity, this holiness, this, this uh, completely in line with what God's word says, is that God will take of his righteousness and he will give it as a gift to us. He will take his righteousness and put his righteousness in us as a gift. It's not by works right? It's not something that we deserve or that we ever will deserve, but he does that when we put our faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior. God says, here is my righteousness. Let me put my righteousness inside of you, which satisfies all of the requirements for salvation. Hallelujah. Only God could obtain righteousness for us through Jesus. We've got several scriptures to look at today, so next we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning at verse 17. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, are you in Christ today? What's it mean to be in Christ? It means to have your faith put in. In Jesus, as God's sinless Son, as Lord and Savior, He died on the cross for your sins. He rose again from the dead, and He's coming again. That is the gospel message. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. God makes you a new creation. In your old state, you were a sinner. If you've put your faith in Christ, you're no longer looked at by God as a sinner. That's why sometimes, this isn't, to me, this isn't just semantics. This is the power of God's word that when you put your faith in Christ, here's the deal. In God's eyes, you're no longer a sinner. You were a sinner. Okay? Now you're a saint because that is the righteousness of God being poured inside of you. Therefore, if anyone is in, is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, or another way of saying that is right relationship. We have a right relationship with God because of Jesus. We know what right relationship looks like, and that's the ministry that God gives to us. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of right relationship, reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What are you? You are, the, if, you, if you have faith in Christ, you are the righteousness of God. Amen? And in order for you to be the righteousness of God, the righteous son of God had to pay the full price for your sin, our sin, the sins of the whole world from beginning to end. He paid it all, right? If you're reading in Hebrews this week, it talked about how he's the, the faithful high priest and about all the sacrifices in the Old Testament were just a foreshadowing of the one who would come and enter into the holy of holies and not the one made with human hands, but the one that is in heaven. He is our righteousness. And he pours his righteousness into us, his his righteousness is precious. His righteousness was purchased by his blood. And we should take seriously the righteousness of God. Amen? 
We should take it seriously. God wants us to understand his righteousness. Now, the amazing truth of God's word tells us that by faith in Christ, we're made the righteousness of God. Well, okay, but what are, in a practical sense, how does that work? Do, you know, does the, the, what, the angels float down and give us some spiritual badge that we can't see? What happens is, when we put our faith in Jesus, he gives to us the promised Holy Spirit. Okay, that's another way of saying, you could, you could call him the righteous spirit, the righteousness of God. And when the Holy Spirit comes into us, that's when we become a new creation. The old's gone, the new's come. And that righteousness, that holiness, if we were to describe in what area of our being does that exist? Is that righteousness deposited in our mind? Is it deposited in our hearts or in our souls? Or that, that righteousness is deposited in our spirit. Amen? His Holy Spirit invigorates your spirit. His Holy Spirit takes the righteousness of God and it puts it in your spirit. That's why you're saved, because you put your faith in Jesus and he gives you the Holy Spirit. You have his righteousness inside of you. We are made righteous by the Holy Spirit. But the Bible tells us that not only are we made righteous, it tells us something else about righteousness. It tells us that we have, a, we have been instructed to live for righteousness. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. It says, He himself, Jesus, this is, this is how serious, this is how serious God is about his holiness and imparting to you his righteousness. That the only way for that to happen was that Jesus would have to suffer and die. That's how serious his righteousness is. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins, and look what it says, and live for righteousness. Amen? By his wounds, you have been healed. That word healed in this context and in its sense means you've been made complete. When you put your faith in Jesus and he gives you the Holy Spirit, your gift of salvation is is complete. Your righteousness, the righteousness in your spirit, it is complete. Hallelujah. God gives us his righteousness. It's funny because um, I don't know what the, the chapter title in your Bible says, but in mine, uh, under where 1 Peter 2.24 falls, it says, living godly lives in a pagan society. Peter is writing to his audience about living a godly life in a godless society. And I was like, yeah, we can identify with that, right? That God's word is given to us in, in, in a lot of senses in our, in our culture today. God's called us to live a godly life in an ungodly society. And in our society, we see many people living for different things. Things like, live for the moment. Live for the fun. Live for the excitement, live for the entertainment, live for the money, or we can get caught up in living to look good in the eyes of others. However, when we look around, when I look around, I see very few people who are living in pursuit of righteousness. And yet Jesus' promise remains. He says, if you'll be the kind of people that hunger and thirst for righteousness, you will be filled. You will be blessed. Sometimes when we think of blessings, we think of all these things that we may have out here, but really that when the Bible is talking about that blessing, it's talking about a contentment of soul, okay, that can only come from God. Now, so far we've established that righteousness is the character of God, also that righteousness comes to us as a gift by faith, in Jesus through the Holy Spirit. But now I want us to look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. Righteousness only comes from God. How can we be made righteous? Only because of Jesus. How do we become righteous? Through faith in Jesus. He gives us his Holy Spirit. He puts his righteousness in us. Let's look at Hebrews 10, 14. It says, For by one sacrifice he, Jesus, look at this because this might get a little tricky. By one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. 
Now, at first look, this verse may seem a little confusing. Is that, wait, wait a second. This is, <clears throat> if I've been made perfect, another word for perfect is complete. Okay? If I've been made perfect or complete, then why do I need to be made holy? That's a good question. Understand that what God has done for you in spirit, where's his holiness at in your spirit? Where's his righteousness at in your spirit? That's why you're saved. You're not perfect, are you? Right? But if you know Jesus is Lord and Savior and you make some mistakes today and you die, I want you to know those mistakes are under the blood and you're going to go to be with Jesus. I said, well, what do I need to do now? God wants you to take this righteousness that he's given you and he wants you to do something with that righteousness in your heart and in your soul. And this, I think, is one of the reasons why God, we, can, we can have Jesus do a work in us, and that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to be hungry and thirsty for righteousness, but God is coming back for a people who are hungry and thirsty, and those are the people that are blessed. Amen? I want you to be blessed. God wants you to be blessed. You're not going to be blessed by acquiring more things on this earth. You're going to be blessed when you hunger and thirst for God because that's when you're going to get full. Amen? It's important that we exercise our salvation. It's important that we take the righteousness that God has given us and by decision begin to exercise that in our heart and our soul. Your righteousness was meant to be exercised. Let's look at Philippians 2.12. It says, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out. Anybody in here work out? Right? Or you're, right? Or maybe just, uh, this is my workout. Okay? Do, do what you got to do, all right? But you, you work out or exercise, okay? We'll go back to it. Therefore, my dear friends, if you all, as you've always obeyed not only my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out or exercise what? Your salvation, or in other words, your gift of righteousness. Right? You're saved by grace through faith. Jesus made you holy. Exercise this salvation, your gift of righteousness, with fear and reverence and trembling. Is that the way we live? I mean, God takes so seriously his righteousness because it, it costs the blood of his son. Amen? And so sometimes we might just be subtle and say, well, Jesus made me holy so I can just live. You know, a lot of times the, the, the authors of the New Testament, they said, don't set aside the gift of grace. Don't abuse the gift of grace. Take seriously your salvation. Take seriously your holiness. Take it seriously. And let it be exercised in your heart and in your mind. It's important to work out our salvation. Why is it important? Our next verses come from 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. It's important because I believe if we, if we take for granted the grace of God, the gift that's supposed to make us righteous and, so supposed to be, and is supposed to work out in our hearts and minds, we kind of take it for granted. And what happens is we end up developing appetites for other things. The, the way that God made us, you, you, you will have an appetite for something. I shouldn't be talking about food, especially on a picnic day. But you will have an appetite for something. Okay? 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. Okay, when I look at that phrase, I think you could also say people will be hungry, right? People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure, right? People that are hungry. What's our world hungry for? Our, our world's hungry for pleasure rather than being hungry for God. Having a form of godliness. So we're not talking about people who have no idea who God is. These could be people that, people that go to church, people that have a Bible, 
right? People that say they love Jesus, but do they? People that are supposed to be in relationship with Jesus, but are they, right? Having a form of godliness but denying its power have nothing to do with such people. That doesn't mean that God doesn't love those people or that God doesn't want to save those people. It just means that bad company corrupts good character. And it means when you run with people like that, you have a, you're going to be affected. You want to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And when we do, God will add all the other things. We don't have to seek after those things. We need to seek after God with a whole heart. These people are described as lovers or pursuers of pleasure rather than pursuers of God. And God hasn't created you to have an appetite for the world. He created you to have an appetite for him and for his righteousness. Now, although God has made us righteous in spirit by grace through faith in Jesus, God expects us to pursue righteousness with our hearts and our souls. And really, when I'm talking about pursuing righteousness, I'm talking about pursuing God. I'm not talking about being holier than somebody else. I'm not talking about being legalistic. I'm talking about the character and the essence of God and his Holy Spirit. And he says, be holy because I am holy. I will give you my holiness. I'll give you my righteousness. And now I expect you to do something with it so that you can be transformed into the character of my son. And I believe that when we act like his son, we will do the things that Jesus did. That's the mission he's invited us to be a part of say i want you to know what it's i want you to know what it's like to have right relationship with me and for you to love it so much that you can't help but be a part of the mission of giving it to other people amen i want you i because i know what it's like to have a right relationship because jesus forgave me i want you to know what it's like i want you to know what it's like to be forgiven i want you to know what it's like to be blessed i want you to know what it's like to be freed from addiction i want you to know what it's like to have hunger for god the only hunger that can satisfy you i want to give you a few points today about creating an appetite for the righteousness of god creating an appetite for the righteousness of god now it is not God's job to create your hunger. He has designed you to be a person who has an appetite. It is our job to dictate what our appetites are like. And God says, I'm going to, so without me, you can do nothing. So I'm going to give you my righteousness. Now, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to live for righteousness? Or are you going to live for sin? If you live for sin, you're going to develop an appetite for sin. Right? But if you live for righteousness, you're going to develop an appetite for righteousness. Again, we're talking about creating an appetite for the righteousness of the Lord, for the Lord himself. He is the one who is righteous. Point number one, we need to feed on the word of the Lord. Feed on the word of the Lord. Maybe I should say that a hundred times. Feed on the word of the Lord. Feed on the word of the Lord. Feed, 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 feed. What are you feeding on? I say, well, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to just, if my heart's not into it, right? Let me say, if you don't go to work, do you get a paycheck? It don't work that way. Well, my heart wasn't into it today. I think your employer wants you to show up. <laughs> Amen? And God wants us to feed on the word, feed on the word, feed on the word. Don't expect to have an appetite for the word before you feed on it. At the end of the service today, for you to pray, God, would you give me a desire for the word? God, I'll, I'll, help, I'll answer for God right now. Nope. But I will give you the free will, which I already gave you. And if you'll use that free will to make a decision to feed on the word, you will create an appetite for me and my word. That's on you. Does that make sense? It's not because God's not answering your prayer. Don't wait until, oh, I'm, I'm going to wait until I get hungry for the word. You're not going to ever, ever be hungry for the word. But you can develop an appetite for the word by feeding on the word. I've got some verses for you from, uh, the first one from Psalms. Psalms 33, verses 4 through 5 says, For the word of the Lord is right. It's righteous. Right? I know some people say today, it's, it's sick. No, it's not sick. Sick's bad. Okay, it's righteous. Amen. I'm going to use the words correctly. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. 
the Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. The, the Lord's word is right. And it has, it has the power to create right desires inside of you. You might be sitting there today, and, and I've, I've been in this place before where I, could, I would listen and say, I don't, I, just, I don't really have a desire to be in the word. I'd rather be doing this. I'd rather be playing this. I'd rather be watching this. I'd rather be doing that. Whose fault is that? It's not his. It's because we feed on things that create other desires rather than feeding on the righteousness of God. Amen? And it's our choice. Choose, the Bible says, choose this day who you will serve. God, make this choice for me. No. I already made the choice to send my son to pay all of your sin. I already made the choice when you put the faith in him to give you the Holy Spirit. I already made the choice to make you righteous in spite of yourself. You choose today, and if you choose to feed on me, you'll develop an appetite for me. And then I'll bless you, and then I'll fill you. Amen. Philippians 4, 8. Paul writes, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true. Well, we just read that. That's the word. Whatever is true. Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. See, our minds, our minds get full of what we feed them. And what you feed your mind establishes your appetite. Okay, If you're constantly feeding your mind a diet of social media, you'll be, oh, so, oh, i got to have social media. I'm having withdrawals. I'll give you some social media. I'm a doom scroll here. Okay. If you have an appetite, if movies, I got to be watching a movie. You know, sometimes it's we got to be listening to something. Something's got to be on. Something's got to be playing. We got, or we feel like we're doing nothing. Right? Appetite for it. Sports. I'll preach against the sports being a god. I love sports, but anything, you can put anything in God's place. It doesn't mean that it's intrinsically evil. Okay. But we are, we are created to love the Lord with our God with all of our hearts and souls and minds and strength. Second commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Right? We're not to create any images before him. Love the Lord your God with all. Okay? Our minds get full of what we feed them. When you feed your mind, you establish an appetite. Where is our appetite for God? Maybe we're not hungry because our minds are so full of other things but you can start developing an appetite for God today. And if you do recognize Jesus' words, blessed are those who hunger and thirst, for they are the ones that will be filled. I will fill them. I will satisfy them. Okay. Point number two. Feed on, so uh, point number one again for those of you taking notes, feed on the word of the Lord. Point number two, feed on time with the Lord. Okay. Time with the Lord. God, doesn't, he, God wants you to have a relationship with him through his word, but your relationship isn't just with knowledge. Your relationship is with the Lord himself. And the Lord will, he, he speaks to me primarily through his word, but he gives me his Holy Spirit. He speaks to me through the Holy Spirit. He speaks to me through other people. Spend time with God and get to know God. In Acts chapter 13, verse 22, um, the Bible refers to David as a man after God's own heart. What a compliment. A man after God's own heart. A man, I think about that, a man in pursuit of God's heart. God, I want your heart. I want to know you, God. Psalms 27, 8. David says, my heart says, that's your, my heart's desire. If you could do anything that you wanted to, nobody else is around, right? And you could do anything that you want to do. I used to want to, I'll go turn this on, I'll do this, I'll watch this, I'll get this done. But, but David developed a heart where my heart says, Lord, I'll seek you. Seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. There's a worship song. I don't know if it's called Daily Bread or not. It is called Daily Bread if you get a chance to check it out. It's called Daily Bread, but I love one of the lyrics in that song because it says, I will seek your face before I seek your hand. And sometimes we seek God because we want answers. We want God to do something for us. But how about being like David and saying, I want to seek your face because I want to know you. I want to know who you are. And I want you to have your way in me. Psalm 27, 14, it says, Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait 
for the Lord. I believe there is a hunger that is developed in us and a righteousness that is found when we learn to seek the Lord and to wait on him. Okay? Where we're, we could seek the Lord through his word, but it's important after we've done that that we take that time with the Lord and say, Lord, what does this mean? What are you trying to show me? Lord, I need to be with you. Lord, I, I, I want to be in your presence. And we begin to pray and we begin to listen. And we be, I think sometimes we might be allergic to stillness. So we got to have something going on. We don't know. We, don't, we haven't practiced what it's like to be still. Just be still. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to put your phone away. Shut off the TV. Shut off the radio. It's okay. All right? And be, just, just be still with God. I think David did that a lot. Be still with God. Okay? And God began to, and, and, and hunger and thirst. David had a hunger and a thirst for righteousness, and David was filled. There's a hunger that is developed and a righteousness found when we seek the Lord and learn to wait on him. Taking the time to meditate and pray and listen and worship before the Lord is essential to developing an appetite for righteousness. Don't avoid stillness with the Lord. You don't have to be doing something constantly. The enemy of your soul wants you to develop an appetite for sin, but he'll, he'll settle for you developing an appetite for distractions. As long as you don't develop an appetite for righteousness. Because if you develop an appetite for righteousness, you're not going to be satisfied. I mean, you're going to be blessed, but you're not just going to be satisfied with your own good standing with God. You're going to be compelled to be a part of the ministry of reconciliation. And that's what God wants, and the devil hates. I just, I, okay, you're saved. All right, take one for the team. I just don't take anybody with you. Okay? But God wants us to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Psalm 34, 8 through 10 says, Taste, taste, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. They're blessed. That's what it means to be blessed. You lack no good thing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. That again, that blessing, that blessing is a full satisfaction in the Lord, and it's so powerful because you can even be walking through the valley of the shadow of death with a smile on your face and a song in your heart because you know that you have, he will transcend you above every problem. Amen? In Jesus' name. Point number three, and I'll, I'll finish here. Uh, thirdly, feed. So we're talking about feed on the word of the Lord. We're talking about developing an appetite for righteousness. Feed on his word. Feed on time with the Lord. God will not make that decision for you. You get to make it. Thirdly, feed on the work of the Lord. And I'll, I'll close with this. So um, in John chapter 4, you might want to check that out this week, we see uh, the story of Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well. And Jesus has, is going back to Galilee, but the, the route that he's taken, taking takes him through Samaria. It takes him into a town called Sychar. It's about noon. The Bible says that he is tired. We assume his disciples are tired. He decides to rest there at a well known as Jacob's Well. The disciples go in somewhere into town to get food. And while he's there, he has an encounter with this woman. She's a Samaritan woman, which means she's half Jew, half Gentile. And on the Jew, full-blooded Jews would look down on somebody that was a Samaritan. You would not even find a, a, full, a Jew speaking to a Samaritan. So it probably caught her off guard when she came to this well to draw water that Jesus said, would you give me something to drink? I think she was taken back. Probably didn't know what to say at first. And she's, how? Why would you even speak to me? And Jesus said to her, if you understood who was speaking to you right now, instead of me asking you to give me a drink, you'd ask me to give you a drink, and what I would give you would be springs of living water that would rise up within you. And by this, he was talking about the Holy Spirit. Okay? And, uh, you know, she's like, well, by all means, give me this water. Give me what I need. And Jesus is like, before I give it to you, what I want you to do is go get your husband and bring him back here. And she says, I have no husband. And Jesus read her mail. He said, that's right. You, have, you don't have a husband. You've been with five other men. Okay. So she quickly tries to change the subject. She says, uncomfortable. 
And who knows, I mean, who knows how Jesus is feeling. I, she's uncomfortable. I'd be uncomfortable too, okay? As Jesus, I, I don't know about you, but I don't like pulling people's dirty laundry out, right? But sometimes that, sometimes that happens. Sometimes it's necessary, right? This is part of the water, part of the cleansing. She starts to ask Jesus. She's like, you know, our fathers say that it's, it's right to worship here, and the Jews say it's right to worship there. Where, where, where do you say that? Let's focus on something else. Where do you say we're supposed to worship? And Jesus says, I tell you the truth. The time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. It's not about out here. Do you hear this? It's not about out here. God's not impressed with our righteousness out here. He's impressed with the blood of his son. He's impressed by what Jesus did for us. He's impressed with the righteousness. And here he says, true worshipers will worship my father in spirit and in truth. She says, I've heard the Messiah is coming. Just as the first time in the scripture that Jesus publicly reveals, he says to her, I am he. I'm the one. She takes off. <laughs> Right? The disciples come back, they're freaked. Like, what in the world is going on? Why is he talking to this woman? They're too afraid to say anything. Let's pick up in John chapter 4, verse 27. It says, Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman, but no one asked, What do you want or why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And they came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. You're tired. You're hungry. You're, maybe you're emotionally exhausted. You need to eat something. Look at what Jesus said. He said, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him some food? Could somebody pick him up some Wendy's? What's going on here? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. What Jesus was saying, he says, you guys don't understand this yet, but you will. But what satisfies me is when I'm doing the work of my father. What, fi what fills me up here... I'm, I'm trying to tell you today that if you want to develop uh, an appetite for righteousness, look, start doing, start doing the things that God drops in front of you. And you know what's funny about this? My flesh is totally the opposite of what Jesus says to do, right? My flesh is like, oh, no, I, if, if I want to get filled up, I need to break. I need to get away from people. I need to rest. I need to have, I need to have, be no, uh-uh. I, I, I'm 50 years old, and I'm ashamed to say it, but in some aspects, I'm just now starting to learn what it looks like to be satisfied by doing things in the flesh that I don't want to do, but they are things that produce a spiritual hunger for me, and there are certain things, certain parts of what God wants to do that will be accomplished by the zeal of the Lord. And we will not have his zeal until we have a hunger and a thirst for him. But when we do, when we feed on his word, when we desire him, he'll create a passion in us. He creates a passion for time with him. He'll even create a passion with, for him to do things that we used to not. Oh, no, I'm not having any part of that. I ain't going to serve as a Sunday school teacher. And I'm not just talking about things in the church. I, I'm talking about, no, I, I'm too worn out. I'm not going to talk to my neighbor today. He's probably going to ask to borrow my hedge trimmers, and maybe I'll have to come. Away. You know, whatever it is that we make some excuse, and God says, Here, I, I, here's the opportunity. I'm putting it in your lap, and if you do it, you're going to taste and see how good it is, and it's going to develop in you a hunger for more. Amen? God wants to give us a hunger for more. How's your appetite? Are you hungry for God? Are you hungry for his word? Are you hungry for time with him? Are you hungry to do his will? Or have we replaced that spiritual hunger with the cravings of something else, with the pursuit of pleasure? You were created by God to be hungry and filled with his righteousness. Last verse, Proverbs 21, 21. Whoever pursues righteousness and love finds life, prosperity, and honor. That, that word prosperity, the blessing. 
the blessing. He wants to bless you and fill you up. You know, when, I, when I'm with God, spiritually speaking, when I'm with him, sometimes I feel like I'm the richest man in the world because I want for nothing. I want for nothing. And yet, we're meant to eat. You, you're going to get full today, right, at the picnic? And you might not eat again today, right? Or unless you stay up late and it's like 10 o'clock, oh, I need some. Uh, but tomorrow, you're going to need to eat, right? And the next day, you're going to need to eat, amen? And on Wednesday, you're going to need to eat. God has developed you to have an appetite. Now you get to choose, do you want to cultivate that appetite for him and for righteousness so that you can be blessed and filled? Or do you want to be satisfied by the cravings of the sinful nature or this world or distractions that, you know what? And the bad thing about that is you have to eat constantly because they will not fill you at all. I mean, you just have to be, what can I get next? Right? Whereas when you're doing the things that God, when you're doing things that God wants you to do, He's going to fill you up. He's going to satisfy. Now you're going to need to eat again, but you're going to lose your taste for the things of the world, and you're going to start being hungry and thirsty for God. And that's when you're really going to get full. Let's close our eyes, bow our heads. God created you to have an appetite, and you're going to be hungry for something. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can train your heart and soul to be hungry for God and for His righteousness because it's only His righteousness that can truly satisfy you and without it, you will constantly be looking for something else to feed on. Don't suppress the hunger that God wants you to have for Him with something else. I want to pray for you today. I want to pray that God would establish a hunger in you. But as I said before, he's not, he's not going to do that against your will. You are going to have to make a decision today to look at what am I feeding on? What do I need to stop feeding on? I mean, if, some, if, something, if you feel like right now you have a greater hunger for something than God, I want you to know that that thing has the potential to be an idol in your life and God wants you to tear it down in the name of Jesus. We don't like to look at those things. We don't like to look at our comforts like that or our appetites like that. But don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that you're so serious about your righteousness. That you are willing to pay the price for our sin with the blood of your son. Jesus, thank you. Thank you. You are our righteousness. And Father, I pray for your righteousness to be applied to each person right now. I pray for a righteous hunger, a holy hunger. And I pray right now in Jesus' name that as our hearts are impressed by your word, as our minds are convicted by your Holy Spirit, that, our, that we would tear down idols and anything that gets in the way of suppressing the hunger that you want your church to have for you, that you want us to be a people who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness, and then you would fill us, and as our cups overflow, that people would see us and taste how good you are that you'd make us ministers of reconciliation and that the church would accomplish by the zeal of the Lord a hunger for God a passion for God the very ministry that you have given us in Jesus name in Jesus name I come up against every spirit that is attached to every unclean thing in the name of Jesus that would try to steal your hunger and in the name of Jesus I bind those unclean spirits in Jesus name father I pray that the eyes of the hearts would be opened right now and that you would loose them in Jesus name and in this time where those spirits are bound and people's wills are loosed I pray that you would create a decision right now for you Lord, may it be like an altar that is erected right now that says, I will be with you. I will be in your word. I will be changed by you. I will be transformed by you. I will do the things of God. I will in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, free your church, God. Free your church. Free your church, God, to be the glorious bride that you've called her to be. In Jesus' name, to represent you well. Lord, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. I, I hope that you'll come out to the park today. And if you need prayer, please come up this morning. We'd love to pray with you. And then we'll see you out at Limestone Park. God bless you.